Good afternoon, thank you very much for coming. You know, since it doesn't seem that central banks would be, will be abolished in the foreseeable future, let me introduce a scheme, an alternative scheme to current central bank to current central banking developed by Hayek in 1930s. And I do apologize to all Austrians, I'm gonna use a textbook mainstream language to show how this rule might operate, its characteristics, etc. okay? So, you know, Wixell can be considered father of modern inflation targeting, and he said that price level stabilization is a superior monetary policy, and Wixell claimed that if price level is falling, the act it's the signal that the actual market interest rate is too high compared to the natural level. Yeah, and as is well known, it is the price level stability, according to Wixell, that is the signal that the market interest rate is exactly at the natural level. So that's the major claim of the Wixellian theory. However, Hayek in 1930 said that this Wixellian approach is valid only in a stationary economy. However, when the economy is growing, when what we today call the natural output is growing over time, according to Hayek, the actual interest rate would be at the natural level only if prices are allowed to decline. So, and according to Hayek, in this situation, the stabilization of the price level would require a growth in the money supply, and this growth, this expansion in the money supply will depress the actual interest rate below the natural level. So according to Hayek, in the expanding economy, when the natural output is growing over time, the interest rate will be at the natural level and prices must be falling, according to Hayek, or if we want to keep the price level constant, we need to depress the interest rate below the natural level. And as my colleague mentioned before me, you know, this expansion in the money supply and the fact that the market interest rate is below the natural rate, it may provoke the business cycle, Austrian style business cycle, where Longer methods are initiated, but they cannot be incompleted, so we go from boom to bust. And in the Hayekian theory, we can have all, even a business cycle in a growing economy under the price level stability, which is at odds with the standard New Keynesian approach, okay? So if the ideal is monetary policy, where money is neutral with respect to the real economy, then Hayek concluded that stable price level might not be consistent with this ideal. So he proposed, as you know, a different kind of policy call. He, he, he recommended to stabilize the MV term. And I would like to discuss how this rule might operate, what would be the characteristics in this, of this rule in the standard textbook language, okay? So, Hayek realized that not only stabilization of the money supply, but the stabilization, but you know, Similar effects as shocks to money supply might also have shocks to the demand for money or to velocity of circulation. There is a very strong connection between the money demand and velocity, as we will see. So, Hayek proposed that money could be neutral with respect to the real economy if three conditions are obeyed. So, the mo total money stream remained constant, first. All prices were completely flexible, second, and all long-term contracts were based on a correct anticipation of future price movements. Okay, what does it mean to have money stream constant? I will focus on this statement in this paper. So, according to Hayek, for constant MV, money might be neutral, yeah? So, he realized that shocks to velocity, to the demand for money, should be reflected or should be offset by a corresponding the inverse change in the money supply. But let me show you what is the relationship between the velocity of circulation and the demand for money. So here is the most primitive version of the demand for money. MD stands for the nominal demand for money, MD over P is the real demand for money. And it mainly depends on income or to be more accurate on permanent income and on this famous Cambridge K, which might depend on the interest rate, okay? In monetary equilibrium, MS equals MD. So every intermediate textbook result is that V is uh, inverse to K, yeah? So only shocks to money demand through K, which affects V, should be offset by corresponding changes in M, according to high. 
not if the money demand is changing due to growing potential or permanent income. That's, that's, the, critical, that's the critical difference. So Hayek recommended to stabilize MV, shocks to velocity or shocks to K should be offset by, by changes in the money supply. Obviously, MV is not observable in the real world. It's not observable in the data. But if this kind of identity holds, MS times V should be equal to PY, where Y is the real income, P is the price level, so PY is the nominal income. So we can say that Hayek was a predecessor, which is today known as the nominal income targeting. Yeah, for constant MV, nominal income should be constant. This is how we can translate Hayek recommendations in modern terms. And it is basically a nominal income targeting with zero growth target. Many new Keynesian economists recommend nominal income targeting, such as Tobin, MainQ, even Woodford today, but for, with positive trend. We can translate Hayek as being a proponent of nominal, I mean, early Hayek, nominal income targeting with zero growth target. It's similar to Sargent's productivity norm, and I don't want to discuss the difference between income velocity and transaction velocity. I'll skip this. Okay, so now the textbook approach, right? How this rule may perform. So, Hayek recommended to keep MV constant. Here is the standard aggregate demand graph. So, MV constant, we PY constant, is this area. This is the nominal GDP, the area of this rectangle. And if this area is stabilized, MV would be constant, okay? And now, let's discuss whether the MV rule is stabilizing or destabilizing. Okay, so suppose there is an aggregate demand shock and many things might happen. Either price level rises, real output rises, or the combination of both. It doesn't matter for the MV rule because in all cases the area will be larger. In other words, the nominal income will be larger after the aggregate demand shock and it's not surprising that. So the central bank, according to this rule, should be restrictive and shift the aggregate demand back. So the MV rule will be stabilizing in case of aggregate demand shocks. And in theory, there are two major difference, two major types of aggregate demand shocks, money market shocks and goods market shocks, or if you want, LM shocks and IS shocks. So let me consider a very simple money market shock. So suppose that spontane, exogenously the money supply increases so the LM curve shifts to the right, the actual interest rate goes below the natural rate of interest, the MV term will go up because money supply is higher, and the high uh, MV rule would require to shift the LM curve back to the previous level. So it is stabilizing in case of LM shock, monetary shocks. Let's consider higher K, so higher demand for money, lower velocity. This shock will shift the LM curve to the left, the actual interest rate will go above the natural interest rate and again the, money, the central bank should increase the money supply to satisfy this higher demand for money and shift the LM curve back. Uh, by the way, in this scheme the natural rate of interest is defined as the intersection of the IS curve and natural output. The IS curve and the natural output. The second type of shock when there is uh, some, like, like exogenous, so animal spirits, you know, investment shock. So ice curve shifts to the right, the economy should end up here if the LM curve was vertical. But if the LM curve is upward sloping, there is a spontaneous increase in velocity and the actual market interest rate would be below the natural rate of interest. So velocity is rising, the economy is booming and the MV term, the MV rule requires to reduce the money supply in order to stabilize MV. Yeah? So this rule will be again stabilizing. So this analysis suggests that regardless of the source of the, of the aggregate demand shocks, the MV rule should be stabilizing for the economy. Yeah? And it seems that as if the central bank should operate at one single aggregate demand curve, which not, it's not the case, let's have a look at the aggregate supply shocks. So consider a negative aggregate supply shock, which is the S curve to the left. Yeah, we start here and then we end up there. Yeah, and when the aggregate demand curve is very elastic, the new nominal income is smaller than at the beginning. The new nominal 
uh, GDP is smaller than at the beginning, so the MV is smaller than at the beginning, and the central bank should expand the money supply, yeah, to keep MV constant. So, the central bank behaves as if the aggregate demand was unit elastic. Yeah, it should also respond to the aggregate supply shocks if a D curve was not uh, unit elastic. So this is how the rule might look like in this simple textbook scheme. This is the same story but with logarithmic scale then this curve will become linear. So again when there is a negative aggregate supply shock and the aggregate demand is very inelastic this is the initial nominal income MV and MV rises spontaneously yeah, nominal income will be larger so this requires this requires monetary restriction to move the economy to the constant MV term. Okay. Well, Hayek said that in the expanding economy the money supply should not be growing but it's only a special case as we can see here. Okay. So suppose that the economy is growing, the natural output is growing and the price level is falling but when the aggregate demand is too inelastic the nominal income should dro will drop. It is the case when the demand for money is is uh, you know income elasticity of the demand for money is too high so in this case even under the high scheme the central bank should expand the money supply yeah so when the aggregate demand is too inelastic we have a growing economy falling price level even the high MV rule will require expansion in the money supply and it's an open question whether it will provoke business cycle or not okay and the most important part of the analysis okay so, MV rule is actually a deflationary monetary rule. It's when the economy is growing. Okay, and let's have a look at the impact on the nominal interest rate in the long run. Okay, so suppose that the economy is on the balanced growth path from the standard growth model. So, in other words, the real GDP is growing at the rate of technological progress G and population growth N. And there is a constant real interest rate. We can, cons we can understand this as a natural interest rate. Okay, so this is balanced growth path, constant growth rate of the economy, technological progress, growth rate of labor, and a constant interest rate, real interest rate. So, and Hayek wanted MV to be stabilized. Output is growing at the rate of N plus G spontaneously, so this requires that there is a falling price level at the same rate with the negative sign. So there must be inflation minus N plus G, the opposite of, as is the growth of the economy. Okay, well, from the Fisher equation, we can see that the nominal interest rate I is equal to the real interest rate R plus the expected inflation. Okay, according to Hayek MV rule, inflation should be the negative of the growth rate of the economy and plus G on the balanced growth path. So when we combine these two approaches, we get that the nominal interest rate in the long run under the Hayek scheme will be the real interest rate minus N plus G. Okay? And well, there is a, there is a, uh, agree, uh, usually economists agree that the nominal interest rate cannot be negative. So, the MV rule will produce a positive interest rate, nominal interest rate, I mean, when the real interest rate is higher than the growth rate of the economy. Yeah, that's the most important uh, statement of this presentation. So, in the growth theory, it is, uh, the economy is dynamically efficient. The MV rule will produce zero nominal interest rate at the golden rule of capital accumulation when the interest rate is exactly equal to the growth rate of the economy. It is the point where consumption is maximized. And Hayek rule fails when the economy is dynamically inefficient. It means that it, if it over accumulates capital, then the interest rate is too low compared to the growth rate of the economy. Yeah? Okay, and when we substitute some number for the real interest rate, we can borrow parameters from the ramsey kass coupons model and the now classical model, where the interest rate depends on time preference row, risk aversion, and growth rate of technologies. Let me go very quickly. Let me just tell you that the Hayek rule should always perform well in this kind of model if time preference is positive, right? It's quite an interesting case that Hayek rule will work if time preference was positive. And finally, let me compare Milton Friedman rule, Friedman rule of the optimum quantity of money with Hayek rule because even uh, in this book, 
Freeman recommended the normal interest rate to be zero, so it means that the real interest rate should be the negative of the expected inflation. It's quite interesting that, let me skip this calculation, that under the Friedman rule, if there is no growth in the economy and no change in velocity, there should be monetary restriction on the part of the central bank. The money supply should be falling at the rate of the positive interest rate. Yeah, that's the outcome of the Friedman rule. And my final words will be about the comparison of the Hayek rule and the Friedman rule. So, Hayek for constant velocity. Hayek required constant money supply. Friedman requires zero interest rate. Yeah? So, if the economy is dynamically eff efficient, which would be the normal case of the economy, when the interest rate is higher than the growth rate of the economy, Hayek rule delivers positive interest rate, and Friedman rule requires monetary restriction. And it's quite interesting, my final sentence, that if the economy was at the golden rule of capital accumulation, if the consumption was maximized, so the interest rate would be equal to the growth rate of the economy, the two rules will perfectly coincide. Yeah, it's an interesting observation that free men would coincide with Hayek under some certain conditions. And in this case, the deflation under Hayek's scheme would be the same under the Friedman scheme. Under normal conditions, what we believe today, what data suggests, we live in the dynamically efficient economy. So in that case, Friedman's deflation would be even stronger than Hayekian deflation. Okay, so thank you very much for your, for your attention. Okay, so my question here would be, uh, what do you think uh, Hayek uh, would recommend um, given the current state of affairs uh, regarding the European Central Bank and its monetary policy? Yes, that's a very good question. Well, if the ECB thought that the nominal income would be falling over time, I think he would recommend a drastical expansion in the money supply if the velocity of circulation is just directly decreasing. It might be the hurricane recommendation. Do not allow MV term to de de decline. Perfect. Thank you, Paul. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you Thank very you much. Pardon? Thank you.